The supply chain industry is driven by buzzwords. A decade ago, probabilistic forecasting and cloud computing were not associated with supply chain. But now it's all the hype. So is AI, machine learning, and blockchain. Vendors are quick to keep up with these trends, but so is false advertisement. Are we being sold pretty brochures and empty promises? This is the topic of today's episode, Joannes. Has the software really kept up with these buzzwords? The thing is, and it's relatively counterintuitive, when it comes to software, it is actually relatively easy and fast to adopt a fancy piece of tech, uh, a piece of tech, even uh, uh, the bleeding edge sort of things. You know, when I say bleeding edge, I mean the, the sort of sort of technologies that bleeds uh, because what it's it's immature. Um, and it is actually very straightforward to adopt that. What the problem is, and that takes much more effort and much more time, is to actually let go of the stuff that the new piece of tech is supposed to replace. That's, that's the problem. And so if you don't actually let go and do all the efforts so that you can let go, actually what you have is a, an incredibly superficial adoption of um, the new piece of tech. What do you mean by superficial? I mean that I would say most novel technologies comes with paradigm shifts, uh, meaning that suddenly it w you're not looking at the problem the same way. You, um, the situation, the world itself has kind of changed. And thus the, one, the way you approach the problem in itself you know, can change relatively dramatically. And so it is very frequently easy to just duplicate what you were doing before in the new paradigm, except if you do that, then there is like zero benefits from being in the new paradigm. Um, just to give a concrete example, let's talk about cloud computing. If what you're doing is simply doing a cut and paste of the software that you had and you just move it to a third party company that ha just happened to rent a computing, I would say computers to you, then you can actually run you know, a COBOL program that was implemented at, in the late 70s in the cloud. It's not because it is now in the cloud that this COBOL program uh, has, I would say, anything more than what it used to have when it was not in the cloud. You see, it is, uh, if you just cut and paste stuff, then usually you know, novel paradigms, novel pieces of tech, they kind of are um, I would say as powerful as the old one in many ways, and thus you can just copy and paste and, and, and transfer, but, but again, you will not gain anything. And that's, uh, that's something, for example, if we take this case of cloud computing, the vast majority of vendors, enterprise software vendors, say that they are you know, doing cloud computing nowadays, but what they have actually done is um, they just literally copied and paste their um, way of doing things from, I would say, um, the, the, the traditional way, which was in-house um, hardware, into, the, um, into cloud computing infrastructure where they're just renting the hardware. But, but beside the fact that they're renting the hardware, there is nothing, you know, uh, they, they, the they, nothing that has changed. And thus there is no added value except maybe, you know, a little trade-off in terms of CapEx versus OpEx. But that's, uh, that's something that is very, very mi minor in the end. So basically, the buzzwords keep up with the trends, but the tech does not necessarily do that. The, the buzzword is something interesting. A buzzword is essentially something uh, that is used by, um, by such a marketing department mm -hmm. to play on a very um, instinctive, I would say, aspect of the human psyche, which is uh, the, simply the, the fear of missing out. You know, oh, there is this grand thing, you know, the, the grass is always greener to the other side, there is this kind of instinct uh, that things should be better somewhere else, you know. The news uh, is always better. Sort and, of idea. and thus, um, when you're playing with these buzzwords, you're just playing with this, uh, with this instinct of uh, this, you know, this, uh, this instinctive fear, the, the fear of missing out that there is something that you should be doing and you're not, and, uh, and, um, and this is it. And thus, by just adding the buzzword, you can make your offering look better. And if you, again, if you decide to have just a, a very superficial adoption, tech-wise, of the buzzword, then it can be also very, very cheap and very, very fast to actually 
give um, some um, modicus of truth into this statement. Mm -hmm. But only on the kind of surface level. Yes, that, that's a problem because um, the reality is that, um, as, as we discussed in, in some other episode about our design, that there are many choices that are typically made within the first year of engineering a software product mm -hmm. that will have, I would say, incredibly lasting impact on the product, potentially decades. Mm -hmm. And thus, um, when there is a new paradigm that comes in, the challenge is that suddenly all your initial design assumptions might be um, completely off with the new reality. Mm -hmm. And it's not about adopting the piece of software that is, or the piece of tech or, you know, that, that is difficult, is to re-engineer all the rest mm -hmm. so that it kind of fits into fits this new, new paradigm. Mm -hmm. Again, for example, if we go to cloud computing, um, you could cu uh, cut and paste your code that brings virtually nothing except, again, a small uh, OPEX versus CAPEX trade-off. Um, but if you start thinking about um, cloud computing as I have now a dynamic, fully dynamic access to uh, computing resources, memory, CPU, storage, bandwidth, and I can dynamically adjust all of those elements to basically, um, I would say, deliver a superior supply chain performance, that becomes a, a complete game changer, but in the sense that suddenly you don't pick one machine um, to do your workload, you pick a fleet of machines which can be resized, you know, dynamically to, um, to cope with your, um, with your intent. But that suddenly that's very, very different from the old way of engineering, I would say software, where you would just write a program for one machine, potentially a big machine, and then you would make you know, the, the decision once about the size of the machine, and this is it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's why uh, nowadays, I would say, uh, the vast majority of the enterprise software vendors are, uh, I would say, claiming that they are doing cloud computing, except if you look under the hood, what they have, um, there is um, th the way I their product is engineered is still entirely driven by, I would say, the, the pre-cloud constraints mm -hmm. that don't really make sense in this new world. So the initial constraints that were put in place by the first tech that got implemented, that sort of gets carried, yes. carried on in, with the sort of this industry trends as well. Yes, and, and in terms of buzzword, because uh, it is just about ticking boxes, yeah. if you just kind of do the minimal effort to superficially do a little bit on, on the side, mm -hmm. then you can tick the box, you know. Uh, your brochure doesn't have to be uh, specifically, I would say, is not naturally reflecting the effort or the number of lines of code that you put into every single you know, uh, piece of tech that you, that you put on display marketing-wise on, on your website. How easy is it to trick? Uh, that's, that's the interesting thing, is that are you tricking? You see, and I'm asking the, this question because uh, I'm maybe you, you know, mm -hmm. doing the devil's advocates, but there, there are several layers to this question. First, um, if you do adopt somewhere in the organization, in your product, you know, the piece of tech, then technically it's not a lie. You know, it is true that, if, for example, if you say, I am using cloud computing and you have, um, let's say, a program that runs on, um, on, on a cloud computing platform, let's say AWS, mm -hmm. it may, this piece of program might just be your website, but technically it's true. So it is, you know, kind again, of yeah, it's, I mean, again, it is true, maybe deceptingly so, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it might be a little bit deceptive, but it's kind of technically true. So it's not necessarily such a lie. That's the first problem, and then we can really argue exactly on what sort of degree, and that that's gets very, very fuzzy, because obviously, when you want to present a software product, you cannot have a marketing description that is faithful to the implementation of the product. You're, you're not going to uh, have an enormous description about low-level libraries that are completely inconsequential for the users, etc. Mm -hmm. So they, they are, obviously, you need to um, uh, to have a description that makes sense from the client perspective, not from the software engineering perspective who is actually engineering the product. And, and that's fine, you know. Again, uh, when you buy a car, um, the person who is, you know, the car manufacturer doesn't tell you 
uh, how many you know uh, um, uh, microns of paint there is on every single part and what is exactly the specific process to actually paint every single metal part in the car you see this is kind of irrelevant beside the point you just trust the car manufacturers to to do um, uh, a good job when it comes to painting you see what I mean so there are, there are tons of things that are very important but you you can't just uh, I would say They're not translated to sales language. Basically. Yes, you, you you have to make choices. You know, you mm -hmm. cannot produce uh, a, a hundred thousand pages document that says everything there is to say about your product. So 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 you have to make choices, and obviously um, you you have to lie by omission, if only by necessity, because uh, the full description would be insanely long, and um, also insanely uh, uninsightful. Just because, again, just think about if you were to describe a car starting by all the thickness of paints on every single part, that would tell you almost nothing about the car and you would be very, very confused to make even uh, a judgment about whether you're actually doing something reasonable or not. Now, um, now there is a second layer to that. So, so that's just necessity, et cetera. But there is also a second aspect that is very interesting, which is, um, uh, where I say, is it a lie? And the question is, lies in the mind of the person who is doing uh, the marketing effort. And here there is something that is very, I would say, peculiar in uh, what I've seen in enterprise software, is that as far as tech is concerned, usually it is completely disregarded in the sense that um, Typically, the top management of many uh, software companies are not software engineers. They were ex-consultants. They were um, people who fundamentally don't really care about the, the software. It, it may seem puzzling because, uh, because this is a software industry. I mean, they do care very much about um, the sort of, of problem and industry you know, they're, they're working on. I'm not saying that they are, they are, they are not caring. It's just that they are not caring exactly about the same thing. And they are not necessarily caring that much about um, I would say, the nitty-gritty details that are going under the hood. And so as a consequence, uh, I have found you know, uh, um, a particular trait. Uh, in, I, I had frequently discussions with my competitors. And uh, the, this trait is that um, literally they are very, very ignorant about the, the, the fine print of the technical details of their own products. And when I say they, I mean typically um, the uh, the executive uh, the executives of uh, layers of, of most enterprise software vendors on the market, and as a result, uh, the idea that you can say something that is true or false is kind of beside the point, you know, because the way you they approach convince yourself to yeah, and it's not sense. convincing yourself. Is that if you approach marketing as poetry, you see, this is you know, uh, it rhymes. So it's good. Mm. Truth is, beside, is, is, is so beyond the point. You know, they, they, it's, mm -hmm. it, is, it is not even relevant. It is a matter of, um, you know, it, it would be like a, a filmmaker and you say, you know what, um, as, a as a criticism for your, um, for, your, for your movie, I believe that the physics of the bullet impacts are incorrect. Most filmmakers would say, frankly, I don't even care. If it looks good, if it entertains people, good enough. You know, I'm not there to actually make a statement about the very accurate, uh, I would say, um, sort of ballistic phenomenon. This is not the point of the movie. You see, you see what I mean? And that's if you treat your, the marketing of your product like that, then it's not even lying. You know, it, it's again, it is beside the point. It is, it is just a, a form of, you know, some of art. You want to have something that is good looking. The fact that there is any kind of technical truth, it's, it's not lying. It's even, it's beside the point. And um, as, a, as a tiny technical anecdote that I had, um, I had several times, you know, discussion with, I would say, again, uh, top executives working for, uh, uh, for, for competitors. And the interesting thing was that, for example, I discussed with them, and some of them were in, in fairly supposedly, you know, technical, uh, I would say, technical position. So they were not just salesperson, they were supposed to be, you know, uh, chief technical officer or something like that. Um, and the interesting thing was, for example, we discussed about CPU versus GPU. You know, uh, do you use uh, what sort of, where does the processing power comes from for, um, for your software? It turned out that literally all of them were 
completely baffled by the very idea that I could even be interested in this sort of question. So you see, the, it, was, it was just... But why I used to get challenged. No, no, no. They, they do challenge all the time. It's just that it, it, was, it was as if uh, I was asking you, how about your skills at sumo? So, I don't care. I've never done sumo in my life. Why should I, I even be developing this sort of skill? So you see, it's not being challenged. They were challenged all the time. It was just a, a baffling question because uh, it's, it feels like very weird. Why should I even pay any attention to that? And, uh, and that's, that's, you see, something that is, that is very intriguing, where, again, that goes back to those buzzwords, is that if, you, if you're not really interested into the tech, if you're not really interested into the nitty gritty of the implementation detail of your product, then most of those questions are beside the point. And your marketing brochure is just a form of you know, poetry, art, and this is it. Sounds like the lines between selling something, the art of selling and simply lying are kind of blurred. Uh, that's, um, that's something that I, I, uh, uh, I address in, in one of my lectures, you know, even the Roman law had this, uh, this concept of, um, uh, of uh, dolus bonus, the good lie, you know, when you go to a market and uh, there is somebody selling fish to you, it says this is the freshest fish ever and this is the best fish you will ever taste. This is kind of, you know, an accepted lie and it, it's, it's okay. And, uh, but again, what is very interesting here is that um, uh, Buzzworth is going beyond that and it's playing, you know, it's not just saying I have the best product. Uh, it is playing on a very specific trick, which is again this fear of missing out. Keeping up with the trends and so Exactly. The and, uh, and, uh, and, and basically, you're, you're trying to create some degree of urgency. And, uh, and I think it's, um, the, um, it's kind of okay, vendors do what vendors do. I think that's, that's, uh, that was you know, the lesson from the Roman law on, on this uh, dollars bonus, is that um, you're not going to have a law to condemn vendors for doing what vendors do. It's kind of beside the point. Uh, this is just in their nature. So the, the problem that I see is more on the client side is, to be better at identifying this sort of, uh, of, I would say, relatively cheap tricks. Out of curiosity, so LOCAD, we pioneered essentially probabilistic forecasts, but now it's all the hype, as we mentioned. Um, has LOCAD been copied? So, yeah, ad, as, um, to, to narrow the claim, to narrow the claim, um, probabilistic forecasts emerged by the very late 70s. Um, um, and, but in areas that were completely, I would say, unrelated to um, supply, supply chain. chain. Um, it, was, it, wa it, it appeared first in finance, and then in the 90s, it became, I would say, gradually adopted um, in, uh, in, in areas like meteorology and, and, some, um, and some, I would say, hard sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, Locat pioneered the idea of applying this uh, in supply chain, and we, uh, in the, in that was basically a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, and, and to use that um, as, a, as a primary, I would say, technical mean to address uncertainty. Indeed, um, since that time, we have been, I would say, um, copied by, by many competitors who are now putting, you know, probabilistic forecasting on their website, on their brochure, et cetera. And so, so yes, in this sense, you know, we have been copied, but again, this idea did not originate from LOCAD, it originate from other people, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea to bring probabilistic forecasts to supply chain, that's sort of what we pioneered essentially on the market. Yes. Um, and following up from that, so to do probabilistic forecasts, you do need probabilistic algebra. Has that been also and included in this copy pasting? Uh, that's, that's something that is very interesting. Is that, again, uh, as I was saying earlier in the interview, you have to make choices of what do you put forward. You know, uh, going back to the car, you can't really detail that you have to have all those details about the paint and the thickness of paint on every single part, etc. So, so you need in your communication to leave out details. Some of them are actually very, very important to, for the thing to work. But uh, is the reason we're leaving out detail, isn't it because we simply doesn't have to because if we if we we can in fact tell our customers but this paint layers on these carpets yeah but by but the way we it do, is we do we have a technical documentation that exactly. detail all that so. but if we do we also have to sort of we have essentially made a claim 
that we can directly check. And yes. if we don't make this claim, we can sort of... Yeah, but that, that's, again, that goes back to my, uh, this sort of things. Do you treat you know, marketing as, as poetry or not? And, and here, the interesting thing is that in our communication, we were putting forward touristic forecasts. We had you know, um, uh, uh, crafted some kind of, 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 of way to present the thing so that it, it could be digestible. But the interesting thing is that some of uh, the technical details, I didn't go too much into that. Uh, it is actually in the public technical documentation of LOCAD, but it wasn't you know, specifically put forward on this channel or mm -hmm. you know, in the lecture so far, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's interesting because our competitors, they copied um, the, 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 the marketing aspects, but they completely leave out the sort of technical details uh, that are necessary. That's the backbone, basically. Yes, to make it work. And, that, and where it gets even, uh, I would say, funnier is that uh, when they kind of you know, spin off on the, on the buzzword mm -hmm. on their own, you know, using the, 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 the same buzzword, but they kind of, obviously, they, 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 they get a bit inventive. And they get inventive in ways that are actually not really working in terms of tech. But mm -hmm. because I suspect the tech is kind of absent this is, this is not really a problem just because it's, it's a pure you know, um, marketing exercise. And so what is very interesting, if we want to go back to this very specific point of probabilistic forecasting, mm -hmm. is that indeed um, probabilistic forecasting is uh, interesting. But if you don't have the tooling to work with all those probabilities, then you're not doing anything with that. And, and very quickly, it, it is, it is uh, losing or practical interest, you know, it, uh, mm -hmm. having generating. It's its advantage, essentially. Yes, I mean, if I tell you, uh, we, we can generate huge matrices of probabilities for um, your supply chain. The answer of a reasonable supply chain practitioner would be, so what? I'm not going to do anything of those probabilities. You know, that's those are artifacts. They, 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 they by themselves, they don't do anything for my supply chain. Only through a careful exploitation of those priorities, I can do something of interest. And it turned out that you need some tooling to do so. And um, we were not really, uh, I would say, putting an emphasis out of that. Again, that was just a, uh, a way to make it more salesy. So we have to leave out some parts that we believe to be too confusing. But it's, it's very interesting because we are now reaching a point where half of the industry are claiming to do poristic forecasting. Uh, but when you look at their documentation, uh, all the part about working with probabilities is just absent, which is kind of nuts. Besides realistic forecasting, has anything else been copied um, from LOCAD? So LOCAD did adopt uh, cloud computing. Uh, so we were, I believe, we were early in this area. I, I would not say we were pioneer, mm -hmm. at least not in the um, in the realm of enterprise software. There were clearly people like Salesforce, you know, mm -hmm. that were that were before, uh, before us. Um, in specifically in supply chain, I believe we were very, very early, maybe not the earliest, but among the, uh, but very, very early. And, uh, and so, but again, Loka did not invent cloud computing. You know, we just took advantage of the technology. But where it's interesting is that as Loka was, you know, putting cloud computing on our website, so plenty of other um, companies followed suit uh, but Jump again, uh, but again, what they did was mostly, and uh, I've been, you know, having a closer look at. Um, I'm following closely many of our competitors. In the end, what they decided to do was just to cut and paste their old code bases into the cloud, and then say, "We did it, and uh, it is now cloud-based." By the way, a simple, just to give you an idea, a simple litmus test to know if it's cloud-based, it um, is the following: Can um, can uh, the vendor create an account for you in two minutes and let you work you know, with a blank state uh, That's instance? That's the of cloud computing, that I can have an account essentially on this cloud that I can access at any time. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't define that, that I'm probably not going to go into the technical technicalities of what exactly cloud computing is today. But uh, fundamentally, as a side effect, if you have engineered your stuff for uh, I would say a cloud computing platform, there is zero reason why you could not have that. Thus, normally you should have it. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. But again, it is, it is like a side effect. It is, if, if you're really doing the thing the way it's supposed to be done, mm -hmm. then there is zero reason why you should not be able to mm -hmm. get started and, uh, 
Uh, and that is as opposed to the sort of old school way where you need to uh, set up a machine, uh, have uh, uh, an IT administrator take care of, of plenty of things, a database administrator uh, take care of plenty of things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, 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 it should be completely, completely straight line so that mm. you can just uh, uh, enter your email address, create an account, and, and be done with it. So if you can't do that from you can't do that, then kind of like a red, red it's flag. A, it's a red flag that it's, it's not even remotely mm -hmm. cloud-based because you, can, you don't even need to get to that point, you, you can even, you know, without having a cloud computing platform, you can already do a lot of things and, and let people register and, and create their own accounts. It's just not, it becomes very quickly uh, complicated to manage and, and cloud computing, you know, make it more straightforward for you as a, um, a software vendor. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, but Jonas, so at the moment, what do you see gets sort of falsely advertised the most among supply chain vendors? Um, I guess I would say the, the sort of, of trendy, uh, trendy buzzword that are, I believe, very misleading are yeah. probably um, uh, in short order AI, machine learning, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe a little bit blockchain, although um, blockchain tend to be, you know, um, blockchain is not typically misleading in the sense that they are not doing blockchain, they are only misleading in the sense that whether they can easily create added value for, mm -hmm. uh, for companies. Um, but yes, I believe nowadays, I would say uh, AI and machine learning are, the interesting things is that the buzzwords, those buzzwords mm. are kind of real. They are, there is substance behind them. The question is that when an uh, enterprise software vendor advertises those buzzwords, the question becomes, is there any substance for this particular vendor with respect to this buzzword? That's, you know, that's the difference. I'm not saying, for example, uh, the research team of Facebook has been um, uh, publishing continuously for probably something like five years, papers that very much uh, uh, qualify in my book as progress towards something that would one day maybe be qualified as artificial, true artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We are not there yet by a long stretch, but the progress is very real and very impressive nonetheless. So mm -hmm. that's people for, for example, Facebook, the, um, their, what they're doing as far as AI is concerned but is outside, absolutely basically. real. And, and, um, and, uh, and, um, and um, I would say a truthful uh, characterization of the intent and the sort of effort and result that is being delivered. Um, I would not say the same thing for most of the enterprise software vendors. Mm -hmm. And then we even have buzzwords that are, uh, I would say, lacking any substance behind it. And that would be, for example, demand sensing. So that, mm -hmm. that is, because you see, that's the sort of thing is that when you start playing with buzzwords uh, as if it was poetry, why not make your own out of thin air? It's not popular at the moment. Uh, yes, but due to what? You see, that demand sensing is, is an interesting case. There is like zero scientific publication, as far as I know. Um, there is ni zero algorithms that have been, you know, really published or recognized. Um, clearly, for example, in the last M5 forecasting competition. So demand sensing for, for the audience is just uh, supposedly a technique that gives you, you know, more accurate forecast. But if you look at um, the last forecasting competition, uh, the, 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 the M5 competition working on a, on a Walmart data set, uh, what was very interesting is that um, there was like zero uh, competitors who actually claimed any results using something that would be qualified as demand sensing. I'm not saying, I I'm sure that in the first 100, because I checked, you know, first 100 competitors that who actually published, not, of them, not all of them did publish, you know, their recipes, but all the people who did, that's probably half of them, um, demand sensing was never to be seen. And even, you know, uh, there was like 900 teams, and again, nobody, and I say nobody, I mean not a single team was claiming to use anything that would look like that. So the question is that that's, that's a very strong test to say, okay, this is just completely made up. And um, so you see, but nonetheless, how, how, how come? Well, it's very interesting. If you come up with a good buzzword, you know, something that, is, that has a good ring to it, like demand sensing, you know, nice, <laughs> uh, then you would say, well, I should copy that. And the interesting thing is that because you're a vendor who treats marketing, you know, and the sort of things that you, to present your product as if it was poetry, you would say, 
I can reuse those terms. And you don't even care about the fact whether it is real for your competitor. And because it's beside the point, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not like you, you care less. No, in, in your mind, it is beside the point. If, if uh, a competitor says, I have a demand sensing technology and, it's, and, it, and it sounds so cool, I'm going to say too, and it's going to mm -hmm. sound cool for me. On. Exactly, and then you end up with, uh, you know, a, a trail of companies who are using the same buzzword, mm -hmm. even if there is still zero substance attached to it. What sort of question can you ask your vendors directly so they can sort of, based on their response to that, the how can you challenge their tech essentially? You see, uh, yeah, that's, that's, again, that's a tricky question because the problem is that you're not an expert. You see, you are not an expert. So you have a problem that don't do you underestimate. Check? And yeah. you see, when you're buying software, you're doing, how, how frequently are you buying software? You know, as, as a supply chain practitioner, maybe once every five years or something? Fair there. You will be discussing with people who are trying to sell their stuff five times a week. So th you, this is a very asymmetric situation. The vendor is literally somebody who has been professionally trained for decades to kind of <laughs> try to, to convince you mm -hmm. that this stuff is good. And by the way, enterprise um, software is immensely profitable. You know, uh, if you look at th those very large companies, uh, they are very, very profitable. And so they can afford to hire, you know, to, to seek people that have really an incredible talent at that. So, you're in a position where it's difficult. You will are facing somebody who is selling stuff to you who has, uh, I would say, who is incredibly good at what they're doing. And so my suggestion is do not trust so much your capacity to detect the bullshit or not. It is, you know, I would say it, you, you, you can be overconfident. Mm -hmm. in, so instead, instead, that's why I suggest, you know, go for the public documentation, ask for the public documentation, and then ask for a competitor of this person you're talking to to make the assessment. What about if you ask them what broke in their tech when they implemented this new tech? They will give you an incredible, I would say, inspiring story about how initially everything was broken and then they, 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 they realize all the problem and they, they learn and the tech gets so much better in the process. Just like that. You see, it is, if you, it is very, very straightforward. And, and again, I'm not even good at that. You know, I'm not even good. I, I'm, I'm, I know that some, some people who are born salesmen, you know, they are incredibly good at that. But what if the answer is that nothing broke, essentially? We implemented it, and now it's working fantastically. Is that a red flag? Maybe, but again, you see, the thing is that maybe it's true. Maybe it's true. You see, again, when, um, when Google started to have uh, their search engine technology, the interesting thing, and that's one of the earliest investors, um, it was you know, realized that it was just a business angel. And they you see, at the time, we were in something like 1996. And essentially, search on the web, at the time, that was like uh, Alta Vista uh, uh, as a search engine that was, uh, and it was essentially web uh, search over the web was completely broken. When you were searching for something like IBM, you would get uh, a website called IBM, IBM, IBM.com, three times IBM, instead of getting IBM.com. So it was the, the, the search, search on the web that was very early, you know, the very early web was completely broken. And the interesting thing was the Google search technology, it was radically better from day one. It was just massive. It was day and night. Uh, so they could really claim, you know, it's not like we learn how to do it the right way. It was from day one, they had a technology that was massively superior to anything that was outside, that, that was outside Google. So, yeah, you see, again, if, they were, if you were asking Google, is your technology better? They would say, yeah. And how, mm -hmm. for, for how long is it been better? Yeah, from day one. Mm -hmm. So you never uh, really know, so but... Now, again, I would say, I would say, you see, again, I've, don't underestimate that um, if you're dealing with an enterprise vendor, the person is going to be able to tell her the story they tell to you so that it fits your weak points. You know, if, and, and they can, you know, adjust and they will know whether the sort of, of, so you see, again, you need to have a question where 
they can't cheat, even they, if they are better than you, even if, you see, and what I'm saying about this sort of technique, which is an, an adversarial technique, is that how do you defeat the lie of uh, an enterprise software vendor? The answer is with another enterprise software vendor. You know, fire against fire. Mm -hmm. And so you will have somebody, you, you just bring to the table somebody who has the same sort of experience and skills, mm -hmm. And, so, and then you let those things, you know, do the, uh, uh, you. Do the work for you. And then in the end, what you will have is conflicting views, but uh, much but more that better understanding. Exactly, research. that will give you, you know, the angle of attacks mm -hmm. for what should you be pressing, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. instead of, of just going blindly and trying to trust your own intelligence yes, yeah. to be able to figure it out. I'm not saying that you're not intelligent. I, I'm just saying that, um, you know, it if I if advice. I go see a doctor. And this doctor tell me that I have a condition, and I need to do that. And he will, this person will give me an explanation, and this explanation is very likely to sound incredibly reasonable, just because I know nothing about medicine. And so, if I want to do that, there is no question I can ask this physician, you know, to to know if this physician is good or bad. You know, I won't be able to assess that. The only thing that I can do is to go to another mm -hmm. physician and have a second opinion. And that might work. Actually, this mm -hmm. is uh, in the real world, this is how you do. You get a second opinion. And you can even cross-reference the opinions. Very interesting advice there, Janice, on how we can assess our vendors better. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.